Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Let's start off giving a lot of love to some recent super thankers, Banana Slug 1951, H5N1 and Co. KG, Brian Gay 57, Salvi Mike, James LaMica, Piao Octonawa, Fred Zerez 7875, and 404 Lyric. Thank you all very much for your kind support of my channel. You are the caterers at my secular soiree, supplying succulent and savory snacks of sanity to satiate the stomachs and stave off spiritual stupidity. Thank you very much for helping me to continue to do what I do. And if you like what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe, click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out, and of course, like the video, maybe pop in a comment. All that goes a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm. Great blasphemy we shall ever commit in its digital name and keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. Today we're looking at a video that was sent to me. It's from a channel called Jaredable Productions. And Jared here is going to be explaining to us, as the title of the video says, God must exist, undeniable truth based on science. I've run into many videos over the years with similar titles, all of them claiming that the proof that they were going to be offering was utterly undeniable, and yet it always ends up being very, very deniable. Either because the theistic arguments were based on fallacious reasoning, a faulty understanding of science, presupposing their position is correct and assuming everyone else would do the same, and a lot of other common apologetic strategies that end up with their arguments being less than convincing to anyone who doesn't already agree with their position. Meaning that more often than not, they end up just preaching to the choir, pun absolutely intended, and reaffirming the already held beliefs of the faithful in a move so fraught with confirmation bias that it boggles the mind that they remain unwilling to see it. But Jared claims that he's going to be using science to back up his claims today. So then, I take it that means that he will have empirical evidence and reasoning utilizing the scientific method and not saying something mildly sciency sounding and then misinterpreting what it means, right? I mean, hope springs eternal. So let's dive in and hear Jared and what he has to say towards proving that God must exist. Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. I've got a question for you. Why does 90% of the population believe in God? Or specifically a higher power? A higher power is not more specific than a god. It's in fact less specific. Because if you were just confining the question to how many people believe in a god, you're going to get a lot fewer than those that believe in some kind of nebulous higher power. And you're going to find a lot of variation in the numbers based on where you are taking the poll from and who is responding to the question. For instance, in the United States, according to recent data from 2023, only 74% of the population claim to believe in a god. And the rates of god belief are even lower than they are in the U.S. and most of the rest of the Western world. Most European countries have significantly lower rates of belief in God than the United States does. Also, since this video is supposed to be concerned with science, scientists are among the groups with the lowest rates of god belief. The research might be a bit dated, going back to 2009, but even then, only 33% of scientists reported believing in God. And with general trends of God belief on the decline ever since then, it's likely lower today. But if you just generalize it to some amorphous, undefined higher power, an additional 18% jumped on the believing bandwagon. But none of this really matters to begin with, if you're aiming for just an appeal to popularity, which is using the popularity of a premise or a proposition as evidence for its truthfulness. That's fallacious reasoning. Even if 90% of the population not only believed in God, but believed in your specific God. No, let's do you one better. Let's do more than 90%. Let's say 99.9% .9 and change. Virtually the entire world was in agreement that the exact God that you believe in exists. Would that massive consensus be evidence for the truthfulness of that claim? Here's a hint. The answer is no. Everyone in the whole world could agree on something, and everyone in the whole world could be wrong. 
And given that even though the vast majority of the world population believe in some kind of a god, the fact that they disagree wildly on which god that is, the nature of that god, or even if there exists more than one, or the level of power that that god has, ability, knowledge, and motivation of that god or gods, it changes the entire dynamic of the question. Unless all of them are right, and there are literally thousands of gods coexisting simultaneously, then the majority of them are wrong about the existence of the gods they believe in. So you're not off to a good start here, Jared, and we're only 10 seconds into the video. Does he exist? Or is it some kind of scam or a trick to fool us? Or is it a human concept that we created in an attempt to give us hope? Today, we're going to find out if there's any proof, whether it's scientific, historical, or any physical proof or evidence that shows us without a shadow of a doubt that God must be real. So, I don't like how you laid out a restricted amount of ways that God belief could be wrong. You said that if it's wrong, it's a scam or a trick to fool us, or a human construct attempting to give us hope. Those are just two of a myriad of reasons that a belief in God could be false. There are certainly other reasons that people could come up with for a God concept that don't fall under those two reasons, like a basic desire to reduce uncertainty by coming up with a being to fill the gaps in our knowledge, for instance. When more primitive people couldn't explain what the big ball of fire in the sky was, it was easier to say that it was some magical, powerful, ethereal being, or at least that some powerful being was controlling that ball of fire, than it was to just admit that they didn't know and they therefore had no reason to believe that it would come up again tomorrow and drive the darkness away. Not specifically about giving people hope in things like an afterlife or a blissful reward for being a good person, but more to reduce the fear of the unknown by pretending they knew why things were the way they were. Other reasons to come up with erroneous God beliefs could be to justify the positive and negative things that we perceive in the world around us. To give weight to rules of behavior and codes of conduct on the supposed orders from literally on high. To unify a society or culture around shared beliefs that set them apart from others and brought them closer together. I mean, there are tons of reasons why people could come up with false god concepts. Some more laudable than trying to scam or trick a populace. Some with more social utility than just giving hope to the faithful. With all the various reasons and motivations for concocting ideas about higher powers and building religions around them, one could say that the formation of various and differing god beliefs is inevitable in any society. Not necessarily because of any degree of truth behind it, but because it's just oh so useful in oh so many ways. There are a lot of options when it comes to believing in some supernatural being. So when you come across someone who doesn't believe, it usually boils down to a few reasons. One of those reasons is a lack of information, or so they think, of a creator, which makes them start to doubt its existence. People are atheists because they just don't know about God? Like, really? What rock do you think people are living under that they haven't heard of God or are familiar with organized religion? Especially in the country that I, and presumably Jared, resides in, because he did say, when you come across someone who doesn't believe. So I doubt he's talking about walking through the rainforest of South America and coming across an atheistic tribe of people. The United States is absolutely steeped in religion. It permeates all of television, movies, music. They talk about God and Christianity incessantly in the halls of government, despite the fact that it violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution. I mean, who are these people who don't believe in God simply because they've never heard of God before. Another reason that some people deny the existence of God is because they know the evidence is out there, they understand that he's probably real, but they refuse it because they don't want to hold accountability for their actions. They don't want somebody else, especially some kind of higher power, to judge them. One reason that people affirm the existence of God is because they know there's no good evidence out there, they understand that he's probably not real, but they refuse it because they don't want to hold accountability to themselves and to those around them, but instead just throw it up to a mythical god figure who will blanket forgive them of their wrongdoings 
just by sending up a silent prayer, and then it's all good. That way, they don't have to actually do anything to redress the offenses they've done. They can just say, God forgives me, and go about their lives guilt-free, instead of actually, you know, doing something to make it up to those they've wronged. See, I can play this game too, Jared. Or, people don't believe in God because they have weighed the evidence, considered it carefully, with an open mind, and a keen understanding of how to properly evaluate evidence and arguments, and found those evidences and arguments wanting. And so, without good reason to believe in the existence of a god, they resolved to not believe in a god until such a time as convincing evidence was presented. Do you think maybe it could be that? So the first one I'm gonna talk about is science. What does science say about the universe? What created it? What started it? Most scientific theories go back to the Big Bang where there was nothing before the Big Bang, except maybe a few atoms and molecules within a singularity, and eventually it exploded, causing the universe to expand and create galaxies, stars, planets, and everything we have here on Earth. Wow. I have heard a lot of apologists attempt to summarize Big Bang cosmology, and they pretty much always get at least some aspect of it wrong but this was maybe one of the wrongest explanations of the Big Bang that I've heard yet. So let's dispel what you got wrong here. You said that there was nothing before the Big Bang. Yes, there was. Well, you said nothing but maybe some atoms and molecules. And no, there were no atoms and molecules before the Big Bang. Atoms and molecules are the building blocks of matter, and there was no matter present when the Big Bang expansion began. As the universe continued to expand and cool, things began to happen more slowly. It took 380,000 years for electrons to be trapped in orbits around nuclei, forming the first atoms. Same with molecules, coming about long after the Big Bang began, as they were matter that came about much later on. The only thing that preceded the Big Bang was a singularity of hot, dense, primordial energy so there was very much something already present when the Big Bang began. Energy. And lots of it. And that energy gave rise to all the space and matter of our universe. Also, that singularity did not technically explode, it expanded. An expansion that is still ongoing today. An expansion that is actually accelerating. That's why it's important to make the distinction between an expansion and an explosion. Explosions begin at their most energetic and lose speed, strength, and momentum over time, whereas the expansion that's currently going on is accelerating. And finally, the Big Bang did not specifically give rise to galaxies and planets and the Earth. That was largely due to the fundamental forces at play, like gravity causing elements with mass to be attracted to each other until they conglomerated into stellar bodies like planets and stars. Matter coming together through the nuclear force. Electromagnetism producing the magnetic field that planets and stars emit and affect their formation and composition. So yeah, starting off with a fundamental misunderstanding of the scientific principles you're building your argument upon is not promising. But that actually contradicts the very rules and laws established by science. Nothing can't create everything because nothing is nothing. It creates nothing. Zero plus zero equals zero, not one. Like I said, misunderstanding of science killed your argument. Science absolutely does not say that there was nothing before the Big Bang. So the argument that nothing comes from nothing is a moot point because no one is saying that there ever was nothing. There was a massive, hot, dense singularity brimming with primordial energy. That energy singularity was in an unstable state, causing it to degrade into the rapid expansion that caused the energy to form into matter over time, eventually becoming all the matter in the universe. 13.8 billion years of cosmic movement spurred by the natural forces of the universe, and you get everything we see around us. So the nothing comes from nothing argument is bunk. But wait, you didn't even say that there was nothing. You said there was a singularity. That is not nothing. 
And you even erroneously said that there were atoms and molecules. There weren't, but if you believe that there were, that is even more stuff before the Big Bang. Most certainly not nothing. So how are you going to say in one breath that there was stuff before the Big Bang, and then in the next claim that there was nothing, and nothing comes from nothing? You're invalidating your own argument. If you're walking down the street and you see a building, you know without a shadow of a doubt there was a builder. Whether he died 50 or 100 years ago, you knew that there had to be a builder. And why is that? Because a building can't create itself. It requires a builder. If you see a beautiful painting, you know that there was a painter. Ray Comfort? Is that you? You see the building in front of you? Yes. How would you prove there was a builder? By seeing it. <laughs> well, that one's very perceptive. The building is proof of a builder. Even if he died 200 years ago, you don't believe there was a builder. You know there was a builder because buildings don't build themselves. When you look at a painting, how do you know there was a painter? Um, by viewing the painting. <laughs> yeah, because the painting couldn't make itself. I'm going to stop you right there. We don't need to hear the full flotsam of that point. Because believe me, we've heard it a million times before. It doesn't hold water, Jared. A building is a man-made object and as such, requires humans to make it. We see a building, we know it has to have a builder, because we know man-made things are made by man. The universe is not a man-made object. You can't say what is true for the building is true for the universe. A building has to have a builder. A universe, galaxy, solar system, a star, a planet, a tree, a rock, a grain of sand, these are things that are natural formations. They do not need a builder or any intentionality behind their formation. They form due to the natural forces at play. You might as well say that when you see a car, you know it was assembled by machines in a factory. So when you see a river, that means that it also has to be assembled by machines in a factory. Doesn't make much sense, does it? Yeah, such is the case with your building builder, so too is the universe argument. And as an aside, don't ever get your talking points from Ray Comfort. He's a grifter of epic proportions. If you've ever looked at the anatomy and physiology of a cell, it looks like a masterly designed blueprint and functions like a computer. And there are trillions of these in everyone. In humans, birds, butterflies, fish, you name it. Cells do not look like blueprints and certainly do not function like a computer. Computers process binary code, a long string of ones and zeros. This is basically what all computer functions are based on. The computer is a pattern recognition engine that carries out all its functions based on this digital code. Cells, on the other hand, are a collection of various biological pieces that work together, such as mitochondria, cytoplasm, ribosomes, and nucleus, that look nothing like any blueprint you have ever seen but look more like some kind of Lovecraftian nightmare fuel if it were human-sized and not microscopic. And they are only what they are today because of the natural process of evolution that built upon prior, much more simple cellular structures. And those early cells only formed because proteins managed to stabilize membranes, which gave them the cell walls that made them individual cellular structures and biological structures that self-replicate and mutate, causing natural selection to take place, resulting in changes in population over time, well, that is absolutely nothing like how blueprints work, and nothing like how computers work. This is another common apologetic tactic, trying to affirm the likeness of biological life forms to machinery, and then concluding that because machines have to be designed, that means that biological life forms have to be designed too. This is a false equivalence fallacy. Claiming that two completely opposing arguments appear to be logically equivalent when in fact they're not, the confusion is often due to one shared characteristic between two or more items of comparison in the argument that is way off in the order of magnitude, oversimplified, or just the important additional factors have been ignored. This is exactly what you are doing. You're stressing the shared characteristics of machines and biology, namely that they're both complex, to assert that what is true of one is true of the other. 
but you're grossly oversimplifying the comparison and ignoring massive amounts of differing factors in order to do so. Simply put, biology is not technology. They are far more different than they are similar, and what holds true of one absolutely does not hold true for the other. Now, for anyone who believes in evolution, science and history and common sense has consistently shown that evolution is a myth and it's false. <laughs> You serious? Now, adaptation is real, and we can see that throughout history that we adapt to our different surroundings. But evolution, and specifically Darwin's theory of evolution with a change of time, there has never been any observable scientific evidence that shows that Darwinian theory of evolution exists. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Science has continuously proven again and again that Darwinian evolution, that is the changing over time of life forms into distinctly different life forms, happens all the time. This persistent Christian notion that things only change minorly within their own kind is nonsense that no serious person actually gives any credence to. And though you just assert that evolution isn't true, and that science has disproven it, and move on without giving any evidence of that, allow me to dwell on it for a bit. There have been numerous transitional species found that prove that animals change beyond just their ill-defined kind, as Christians like to insist. We have a direct biological link from the land-dwelling Pachycetus to the partially land-dwelling, partially aquatic, Ambulocetus to the fully aquatic Bacillosaurus that still has the vestigial legs even though it lived entirely in water, and on and on until they become the modern whales and dolphins that we see today. There is no longer really any doubt that birds are a type of dinosaur. These days, the debate is about details. The strong evidence doesn't just come from fossilized bones and similarities found across the skeleton, but from fossilized soft tissue, especially feathers. Many dinosaurs had not just some kind of body covering, but distinctive bird-like feathers. And these are just a couple of the proofs out there detailing Darwinian evolution. There's a reason that it's called evolutionary theory. Because in science, a theory does not mean a guess or an unproven idea. That would be a hypothesis. A scientific theory is an explanation of an aspect of the natural world and universe that can be repeatedly tested and corroborated in accordance with the scientific method, using accepted protocols of observation, measurement, and evaluation of results. And there are mountains and mountains of verified data attesting to the veracity of Darwinian evolution. Come back when you have something more than just asserting that science has disproven evolution. Trust me, I'm totally right about this. No, Jared, you're not. You are provably wrong. If I were to roll this die, the probability of me rolling a 6 would be 1 in 6. Now let's say I rolled it again. The probability of that would be 1 in 6 times 1 in 6, or 1 in 36. And if I keep rolling the same die, the probability and chance of me getting a 6 consistently gets harder and far less likely. In fact, the odds of that happening are 1 in 10 to the 55th power. That's 55 zeros. A mathematician actually worked out the odds, and he said if you were to roll this in the hopes of getting 70 sixes, you would have to be rolling this die for 100 trillion, 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 trillion years. This sounds familiar, like I've heard it before. I can't quite put my finger on it. Oh wait! If I roll this dice, the chances of getting a 6 is 1 in 6. That's not too bad. But what are the chances of me rolling 6 twice in a row? Well, the odds get longer. It's 1 in 6 times by 1 in 6. That's 1 in 36. Chances of rolling a 6 70 times in a row are around 1 in 10 to the 55. That's a 1 with 55 zeros after it. Well, I had a mathematician friend work it out for me. 
On average, you would have to continually roll this dice for 100 trillion 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 years. First you copy Ray Comfort, then common anti-evolution nonsense, now ripping off Justin Brierley? So this argument has been debunked many times before, but the shorthand refutation is that using big numbers to try to dazzle the audience into believing you is a deceptive trick. This notion of the inflation of the universe having odds of 1 times 10 to the 55th power comes from Alan Guth, a theoretical physicist and cosmologist. And by the way, he not only believed in the Big Bang expansion of the universe, he came up with a model of the inflation of the universe from an initial small-scale vacuum state. But the big numbers should not be deterring towards believing in the universe's expansion. Because the reality is that the expansion rate had to be something. Even if every speed at which the universe could expand had the same odds, which we do not know to be the case, it still holds that the universe has to expand at some rate. It happens to be the rate that it did. In hindsight, the odds of it being the rate of expansion that it was is actually 1 in 1. Not 1 times 10 to the 55th power, 1 in 1. And we don't know that it could have even been any different. Maybe it could have been, but we also don't know that if the speed of expansion had been different, that it would have significantly impacted the way the universe formed. Because, as I said earlier, the speed of the universe's expansion is not static. It's not constant. It's accelerating. And that acceleration doesn't seem to be harming us in any way. And it's not only accelerating, but it's accelerating faster than scientists thought that it would. And again, no harm done because of it. The expansion would have had to have been massively different than it was to critically affect the way the universe developed. And again, there's no reason to think that it even could have been a different speed than it was. I mean, that's like saying that if you set off a firework, when it blows up, it has an equal chance of exploding at 100 yards per second as it does of 1 yard per second. No. The forces at play dictate approximately how fast that explosion will move outward. So, logically, there's no reason to think that any other speed of universal expansion is equally as possible as the speed that we got. Deep down, all human beings know that God exists yet we deny him in an attempt to escape authority. The evidence is out there. Well, if it is, you certainly haven't offered any of it up in this video so far. All you've done is make assertions with either no evidence or arguments to back them up at all, or misunderstandings and misrepresentations of scientific principles and findings. And even though we're only at the halfway point of Jared's video, this is where the supposed science that his undeniable science-based arguments for God ends. He spends the next two and a half minutes belaboring the old everyone knows God is real but they just want to sin shtick that so many apologists lean into and then gets into an insistence on objective moral law that God's written onto everyone's hearts. Again, no evidence given for any of it, just bald assertions backed up by nothing. So let's jump ahead to the next thing that is not just his own claim, but is actually something he can point to as some sort of evidence. Now, historically speaking, there is actually evidence of God, and a lot of cultures share a lot of similar stories. But the most historically accurate and the most reliable religious evidence of God that we have is only exclusively found within the Bible. Yes, that's right. Jared's next piece of evidence is the Bible. He starts off calling it historical evidence, but then, in the very next sentence, calls it religious evidence. Well, it's certainly one of those things. Can you guess which, Jared? Hint, it's definitely not historical. The Bible is not a reliable historical source because it does not meet the standard criteria of source reliability used by historians. The Bible is not, as many believers assume, eyewitness testimony. Reliable sources are generally based on authors who were eyewitnesses to an event, i.e. it's a primary source. Since any particular source may be fabricating their story, multiple independent sources are usually required for confidence. Establishing the lack of author bias, including religious motivations, is also necessary if a work is to be read at face value. 
The Bible satisfies none of these requirements. No non-Christian motivated historian even entertains the idea of using the Bible as a primary source for virtually anything. There is no verification of the authorship of the various books of the Bible, despite the church's claim that the Gospels were written by the apostles they were named after. There is no verification of the events that are described in the Bible, either Old Testament or New. There are contradictory accounts of events in the Gospels, such as disagreement of the time of day Jesus was crucified, or the events that transpired after finding his tomb empty. So the Bible actually disagrees with itself about events. And there is the little issue of things talked about in the Bible that are demonstrably false. Like, for instance, The creation of everything, the flood, dinosaurs, historical events. The creation story in the Bible is absolutely wrong. Not only was the earth formed over a period of 10 to 20 million years, not seven days, the earth was not formed first, and then the sun and the moon afterward, as said in the Bible. The sun came way first, then the earth, and then later the moon came out of the earth as a result of a planetoid strike that tore a chunk out of the earth, and that's what became the moon. The global flood never happened. The Bible does not talk about dinosaurs, but mentions creatures called Behemoth and Leviathan, which even creationists recognize are references to the hippopotamus and crocodile. Most certainly not dinosaurs, because dinosaurs never existed anywhere close to the same time as man did. The Bible gets so much stuff wrong that even though it does get some stuff right, like that places like Jerusalem and Galilee are actual places that did exist 2,000 years ago, Nothing it says can be taken at face value as historical, and everything needs to be verified by other sources. And most of it absolutely cannot be. Certainly none of the parts proclaiming miracles, prophecies fulfilled, or practically anything about the life of Jesus can be confirmed to have actually happened. I can guarantee you, if you ask the right questions, and if you really truly search for the answers, the answers are there, but you have to put away your pride and your sense of self-righteousness and thinking that you have to be right to prove something to somebody. Put it aside, look for the objective truths, and I guarantee you, you will find them. The Christian lack of self-awareness never ceases to amaze me. I would say literally the exact same thing to you, Jared. Set aside your Christian self-righteousness and honestly seek the objectively true answers because they are out there. I mean, I don't know what kind of QAnon, Christian fundamentalist, flat earther style rabbit hole you went down to convince you that the insane amount of evidence for evolution was all false, or that somehow science has actually disproven evolution, or that the Bible creation account was true, or that the Bible was completely perfect and flawless when its flaws are evident on practically every page. But you have well and truly drank the Kool-Aid. And the self-assured, self-righteous nature of your Christian position was evident in how you pretty much spent half of your 12-minute video banging on and on about how people who don't believe in God are just denying the truth because they don't want God to be real. And the whole, trust me, God is real, and you're going to be sorry when you die and realize that I was right the whole time. I'm super serial, guys. Trust me, bro. I know what I'm talking about. I mean... Of course, this video was largely just more of the exact same thing we've heard time and time again, because most of Jared's points and arguments were taken directly from other apologists. He couldn't even be bothered to come up with a new way of making the same old arguments, he just copied them verbatim without attributing them to those he took them from. Throw in a complete misunderstanding of science, he claimed his video was based on, and follow it all up with a heaping helping of, but my holy book says and you've got another failure of a video insisting it's undeniable when it's anything but. So that is where we'll end things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.